Welcome back to Second Helping, the podcast of choice for fans and followers of the number one league in all of collegiate athletics, the Southeastern Conference. Travis Ryer, Senior Analyst for BamaOnline.com, part of the On3 Network, alongside my great friend and co-host, Brent Beard, longtime college football analyst, most recently for First Coast News down in Jacksonville, Florida. Of course, Brent, also a voter in the race for the most prestigious individual honor in all of college athletics, the Heisman Trophy. And we are officially into the month of March, Brent Beard. We record this on a Friday, March the 8th. We've got spring football practice blooming across the league. We've got March Madness on the hoops front here right in front of us. But no shortage of topics no. at the national level either. I mean, we talk about the recruiting calendar, which we'll get into first. Uh, that seems to be an ever-changing situation as well. Yeah, it does. And what we see on the latest is the appropriate committees have met and they have decided that uh, the early signing period uh, will, uh, they have moved it in December, which they really needed to do uh, the Wednesday after the end of the regular season and before uh, the conference championship games, that moves it away from like the 20th to 21st. Uh, that was the same time as the uh, transfer portal. Now the transfer portal and the early signing period are uh, at different times, which should help coaches somewhat. With, now that there's also a proposed period uh, in the summer trial that has been tabled. It will be taken up again uh, in the next few weeks. So right now, definitely we've got the first Wednesday in December and then the first Wednesday in February. So that they're, they're trying to make some, some sense out of a schedule that was absolute nonsense. Yeah. With the college football playoff expanding and those dates right around where we've had yes. the, the early signing date in the last couple of three years, it, it had to go. I mean, you, you weren't going to have an early signing period sitting right on top of the first round of the expanded college football playoff. And then also keeping it in a somewhat similar time frame also allows for all these early enrollees that we see yes. now that are able to make that move, maybe get into bowl practices and then enroll at their selected universities and programs in January. So it still allows for that. The summer – the summer date will be interesting to it watch will. because, well, you talk about a busy time right now. March is really busy because you're coming out of a dead period. Uh, then you get into really June and July with all the camps and all the official visits now that we see in the summer months. And look, you know, if you're a prospect and you feel like at the end of that run before your senior football season, uh, your senior year of high school, you want to go ahead and make that choice to, uh, commit fully uh, and document it, uh, you can do that. But it sounds like there's still some things they're trying to sort out. Yeah, they are. Uh, and I think they'll be able to do that, particularly in the summer period. That's something you and I have talked about for years, that it would be, it would make some sense to have something in either June, July, or August before the season begins. Uh, and Trev, one more thing to this, transfers will now, be able to sign a national letter of intent starting in December of this year. Um, the schools want this, uh, which is not surprising because there's nothing that really binds any of these players to the school when they transfers. So now for what it's worth, they will be signing their own national letter of intent if you transfer. Yeah, boy, just a lot of different stuff to figure really out is. these days between the portal and – the grassroots recruiting uh, that has typically taken place. But, you know, something that is probably going to take a little bit of an adjustment to Brent. We're old enough to remember when the implementation of Thursday night football yes. was a big thing. And now oh, yes. it seems like we've had Tuesday night, um, action, fun belt, Wednesday night football on the, on the college level. Uh, and what you're telling me now is looks like Friday night, which we've seen in the past. But it sounds like it's going to become a real thing once again. Yeah, and and I have mixed emotions about that, uh, certainly because of the high schools. But that's not stomping fonts at this point. Big Ten, Big Twelve, Mountain West, 
Now, these may not be tremendous games, but uh, no doubt Fox wants a presence uh, on Friday night. And Trav, the re one of the reasons given uh, is uh, Fox not renewing WWE. How about that? <laughs> so uh, they had to, they wanted to put something there, uh, and and um, uh, so we we've kind of uh, heard rumors about this, but it looks like that's what's going to happen now. A a prime time Friday night game on Fox. How about that? Yeah, I'm with you on the high school front. You know, I feel like if you're a real fan of football and you have an opportunity to get out locally and Absolutely. support high school football, that should always be the top choice. That being said, now the high schools are streaming their games. Just yeah. about every high school right. you know of has streaming football of their teams uh, on a Friday night, Thursday night, whenever the games are played. So in some ways, the high schools aren't helping themselves to begin with. If you're talking about just pure attendance, people at games, those type of things, because you've got networks like NFHS uh, and I've done it. Mm -hmm. you know, it. It's not a bad thing to be maybe eight hours away from a big game sure. that you would like to watch, or maybe even a game out on the West coast. You got some LA schools going at it late on a Friday night. You can pretty much for 10, 12 bucks a month, yeah. Watch as many high school football games Absolutely. at home right now yeah. as you could possibly want to consume. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that with Friday night college football. Something else we wanted to talk about today is it's going to be interesting moving forward, Brent, because there won't be, in my estimation, maybe Kirby Smart, there won't be another coach or two in the SEC who moves the needle based on their comments more than a couple of guys that aren't yeah. going to be coaching. This That's fall. right. We've seen it just in the last week, right? Nick Saban with some comments related to his departure, his retirement at the University of Alabama. Uh, Steve Spurrier mm. with some comments in relation to Billy Napier. Uh, I'll say this. I love the transparency of both these guys. Yeah. Uh, I think if you're probably the athletic director <laughs> at either Alabama yeah. or Florida, yeah. you're cringing. Yes. You can't publicly sort of reveal that type of angst based on those comments. But, man, Steve and Nick, you talk about a podcast. That's the yeah. one we need, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That, that lit up talk radio for most of the week, frankly. Uh, we can kind of take them one at a time. Uh, Nick Saban, in an article with uh, Chris Lowe of ESPN, uh, really kind of opened up on some things that uh, he was, I think, uh, certainly disappointed about, but it led him, I think, to make uh, a incredible decision that affected college football, uh, but certainly in his comments, thinking that they were really going to be good next year. Um, but uh, and talking to uh, 70 or 80 percent of his players, they wanted two things. Uh, I want reassurance of where am I going to be in the depth chart and how much money am I going to be making? Trev, what he wanted to hear was, okay, coach, how can I get better in the offseason and get ready for the fall? Trev, that wasn't what he heard, was it? No, and it's interesting because it, it aligned with what I had heard kind of in the yes. in the aftermath of Saban's decision that, you know, Saban handed, handled it like he does everything else, very businesslike. He did. You know, it wasn't really an emotion-based decision or, you know, when it happened, everyone figured, okay, what's wrong, right? What's wrong with Nick? Yeah. What's wrong right. with maybe some family people? Or Miss Terry, yeah. Or Miss Terry. And it just sounds like Nick went to work like he always does. Yes. At his exit meetings, like he always does, was continuing to interview assistant coach candidates. DJ Durkin, who ultimately landed at Auburn, was involved in that mix there right up until the end. And at the end of it all, Saban got his information. He loves his data. He does. He got his data. He got his information. And he walked downstairs and said, I'm done. Yeah. Just like no. that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much what had been out there was that 
seven or eight out of every 10 players that he talked to, it wasn't about what you talked about. Hey, coach, I know I'm third right now, but what can I really focus on here in the next few months to maybe get myself in a better position to be where I want to be and help us win? No, I think that's an era. That's a bygone era at this point. And Nick at that point decided his fun meter was pegged out as it relates to coaching college football. And when you think about it, Brent, it was probably those kind of meetings that he had with the Dolphins that probably that helped probably. Alabama get him yeah. back to oh, the yeah. college level. Oh, and yeah. so if you're Nick Saban and you're thinking, you know, this kind of sounds like the meetings I had in the NFL. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't my thing as a no. head coach anyway. No. And kind of lines and, up, I guess. Uh, it does. And Trevor, another thing I've heard uh, along with this was he was interviewing coaches and uh, as assistants they told him, Coach, I'd love to come and be on your staff, but I'm pretty sure you're not going to be there but another year or two. So, Trav, you put the players and the coaches together, and for him, that was a pretty logical decision, wasn't it? And on top of that, it's it's hard to get the guys you really want to even yeah. work at the college level, even at Alabama right now. Right. You know, if right. these guys, as we've said, if they can get to the NFL right now, they're going to the NFL, like for like. If they can be a DB coach at Alabama or with the Cowboys right now, they're going to go to the Cowboys or the Browns or whoever. So it was, I'm sure, getting more and more difficult, not only to locate the quality that he wanted, but to convince even the quality that he wanted to make their way to Tuscaloosa. Now, Steve Spurrier uh, <laughs> had some interesting comments. Was that with Gene Fournette of the Florida Times yes. Union, by the way? Yes, it Tell was. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, Spurrier uh, was uh, sent out with Gene Fournette, and uh, Gene basically asked him uh, just to give an opinion on the program uh, and, and to kind of see where he thought it was going. Well, he got maybe more than he bargained for, or maybe not, knowing Steve Spurrier, quote, there's a feeling around the Gators of what the heck are we doing? There's a lot of questions that I don't have answers to about the organization. Just because you've hired a lot of people doesn't mean you're going to win. All the extra people, I question (laughs) how much of that is going to help. Billy Napier is a good guy, works his tail off. I like Billy, good family man, but do we wish the organization that we do was a little bit more tidy, Trav? Tidy is a word that he used. Now, look, <laughs> uh, we we always don't expect the company line from, from Steve Spurrier, but I'm not real sure how much this really helped things and how much that uh, this was pouring gasoline on the fire at this point. But Spurrier speaks his mind. Uh, I, I just thought this may have, if, if you know, if he just said, "Look, you know, he he's growing and learning. We think things will be better." But you're certainly not going to get that out of uh, out of Steve Spurrier. But the reality of this is, uh, when they line up to play Miami uh, the, the last Saturday in August, no one's going to be thinking about this statement. But you and I have covered Steve Spurrier since he's been at Florida and even when he was at Duke, Trav. Uh, his comments, frankly, were not surprising in a lot of ways. Well, and these are the kind of comments that we're going to miss, especially with Nick Saban moving yeah. on now. Oh, yeah. When you get together for media days in July out in the Big D, out in Dallas. I mean, right. you think about the current lineup, uh, you're going to be counting on drink of Missouri um, yeah, really. in a lot of ways to, to fuel some things maybe. But – you know, I think Steve Spurrier essentially said what the rest of Gator Nation mm-hmm. is feeling right now. Yes. But the bottom line, as you said, is this. Win games and it'll all go away. That's right. It'll yes. all be muted. Uh, that is the bottom line for Billy Napier at this point. Does it feel ominous uh, in terms of his ability to do that? Yeah, I would say so at this point. And look. You can talk about staff sizes. Nick Saban kind of implemented all of this sure he did. at Alabama. And you know what? Nick Saban won six national championships right. with it. That's the difference. Yeah. If you're winning, yeah. nobody cares. If you're no. losing, it becomes, well, gosh, you know, it just seems seems unorganized and just uh, 
a little much, but uh, you don't need that. You don't need that if you're Billy Napier. No, um, you don't. Because it's already, like I said, what most of that fan base is. That fan base is already on the other side of whether or not you can or can't get this job done in, in their beliefs at this point. It would take a major shift coming up um, to change that sort of point of view for Gator fans. And then for Alabama, Brent, you know, you're trying to get caught up in this NIL race because Nick has made it very clear in terms of its current form and it's how it's not really structured in any form or fashion. He's not a fan. No. And no. I, he has reiterated, he's okay with players being able to make money for themselves and those type of things. But without some type of structure uh, in his eyes, and I think in the view of many people, it's, it's a mess, it but, is. Um, but it doesn't help your, your program uh, to raise money. When you go to like functions where you get up and you're asked about NIL and you're truthful and honest and you say, look, right now, the way it's set up, it's, it's horrible. Yeah. Oh yeah. At the end of that, at the end of that appearance, you got NIL people asking your fans for donations to NIL. Yes. Yes. It kind of makes things tough, you know? Uh, Well, there have been two articles this week, Travis, uh, on the national scale about uh, NIL booster fatigue. Yeah. Uh, Already. Yeah. Already. I mean, we're not two years in, three years into this. Absolutely. Uh, And, and there is a lot of questions and I get this. Look, how much more can I give uh, at at this point? And that makes a lot of sense. And look, uh, I'll, I'll be brief on this, but this is why you see the SEC and the big 10 and those commissioners, they are saying if they're, we're, we're, we're trying to give the NCAA some time uh, for them to come up with some answers to this. If they don't, we're going to come up with some answers ourselves for our conferences. And, and frankly, Trav, I think that's kind of where we're going a whole yeah. lot more than depending on the NCAA or Congress to do something. Yeah, and even in terms of alliances like the SEC and the Big Ten and the big picture of what – super conference college football is going to look like. If you think we have super conferences right now, no, I, I don't, yeah. I don't think we're quite there yet. No, I don't not. think we're all the no. way there in relation to that. So definitely things interesting when you talk about Nick Saban and Steve Spurrier here in the last week with some commentary. I um, wanted to ask you this too, as we move through spring practice or into it at some places, Talking about another former SEC head coach and Bobby Petrino back at Arkansas now as the offensive coordinator. This feels like a lifeboat situation for Sam Pittman in Arkansas. So I'm going to ask you straight up. And I think it's the question on a lot of folks' minds when it comes to the Razorbacks in 2024. Can Bobby Petrino and the ironies of all ironies, it would seem, uh, save Sam Pittman? Yeah. Well, uh, that's very possible. Um, and and my, what I would wonder is, let's just pretend for a minute the offense uh, does real well. Then you mentioned this uh, on our last podcast. Taylon Green, uh, the Boise State transfer, uh, is – and they've got Jacoby Chriswell there too. Uh, so they may have two decent uh, prospects in quarterback – I'm just wondering if that offense does well, but they still struggle. Uh, I mean, this will be uh, SEC-like, wouldn't it? If Bobby Petrino ended up getting that job again one day as head coach. But but I think for the for the here and the now uh, that uh, I give Pittman some credit. He knew that he needed to get that offense going, particularly since Rocket Sanders, and we'll get into this in a few minutes, transfers to South Carolina. Uh, so, and I don't think a lot of folks have heard about this yet, really. But but look, he, that that's going to be a, uh, a really incredible, uh, I think, addition, Travis, uh, to this football team. <clears throat> it's, it, it, is, it is a risk, but the, uh, but the rewards could be well worth it, too. Yeah, I agree. I, and it's a it's a rock and a hard place for Arkansas and yeah. Sam Pittman because you got Oklahoma and Texas coming into this league. It's already tough enough to recruit in some ways at Arkansas. You don't have the uh, 
nearby and local talent base. You've got to go to Texas. You've got to recruit Louisiana. Uh, you got to go in the surrounding radius of about five to six hours from Fayetteville, I would think, to get some stuff done. So you better be schemed up and coached up on that coaching staff. And I think yes. defensively, they feel like they were already in a good place moving forward. The Dan Enos situation obviously did not work out. That no. was a disaster. No, it was. Post Kendall Bryles. So maybe it is Petrino. And I, and I said this before, I think some of Petrino's most important work, if not his most important work, will come with getting green where he needs to be yes. as the transfer yes. coming in from Boise State. Hey, we talk about the transfer portal, Brent. I mean, is this even an issue for Georgia? Because I think from the outside, people look at it. Georgia's yeah. won two of the last three national titles. Georgia's obviously a top two, top three program in all of college football. But sounds like even the Bulldogs aren't immune to departures when it comes to guys looking for greener pastures. Yeah, Chad Lindbergh, when their offensive lineman is transferring, I mean, he was highly thought of as uh, the, virtually all the Georgia – players are, but he is the 20th scholarship player from Georgia to enter the transfer portal. So uh, some roster management, obviously, for Kirby as this goes along. And uh, the, and particularly, there's some talk about, well, what are they going to do now at, at wide receiver after Lad McConkey goes to the NFL? Uh, Marcus Roseme, Jack Saint, uh, and some guys of that nature, but yet – then people think about, well, uh, the um, Dominic Lovett comes back, Dylan Bell comes back, Ra Ra Thomas, Arian Smith, Anthony, Anthony right. Evans. Uh, at the bottom line is uh, they're stacked up like cordwood still, Travis. I think they'll be okay. Yeah, there's a difference in Georgia losing players to the portal, yeah. and let's say like Boise State. Yes. Because if you're Boise State, you're probably losing top 10, top 15 mm -hmm. guys on your roster right. who are looking to get to Georgia. Whereas if Georgia's losing guys, it's probably not top 30 or even top 40 guys in a lot of situations. Now, we've seen some key guys move on from Georgia, sure. uh, even within the league. Uh, but the point being, these are replaceable guys. These right. are more in all likelihood – depth providers, special teams guys that you're going to be counting on. So not quite the same, not apples for apples. No. When you talk no. about the transfer portal, even when you get into numbers like 15, 20 guys that are deciding to move on. And speaking of moving on, you mentioned Rocket Sanders moving on to South Carolina. Um, you know, just on the surface, because of what we talked about last week with Carolina's quarterback situation, I got to think, if possible, Shane Beamer and that offense are going to lean a lot on oh, Rocket. Man. Oh, yeah, absolutely, especially, especially with Spencer Rattler, uh, who you and I think is going to be a really good NFL quarterback one day, uh, has moved on. I love Sanders. And Xavier Leggett. I that, mean, that's absolutely. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And Sanders was – he was hurt a good bit last year. Didn't, didn't play in a lot of games, but I think this is a money year for him, uh, and I think he'll be fine. I mean, in 2022, he ran for 1,400 yards. People may forget that, uh, but, but but this guy is really good. Spe speaking of transparency, um, uh, and this will tie into Georgia a little bit, James Coley goes to Georgia, uh, kind of left – uh, Shane Beamer in a little bit of lurch uh, as receivers coach. Uh, Shane's reaction to the <laughs> Shane's reaction to that the previous receivers coach made a decision that he felt was best for his family. We collected the four hundred fifty thousand dollars and then some that we were owed for violating or leaving his contract. And allowed us to go out and hire an even better wide receivers oh, yeah. coach in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so, so bitter, Shane bitter beamer. Yeah, bitter beamer's the best beamer. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Shane's got Shane's got a little dabbo in him. He does. You know, he really he does. does. Some things, and uh, it's interesting to have both those guys in the Palmetto State together. But mm -hmm. you know what? I'd like to see from Rocket Sanders. I'd like to see a more streamlined Rocket Sanders. It just yeah. seemed like. During his time at Arkansas, he got bigger and bigger, and it didn't really 
play into the handle of rocket. You know, he looked more like a tank yeah. than a rocket. Right. And so uh, last season, I know he had some issues, uh, but it just felt like it wasn't a fully engaged rocket Sanders that Arkansas had. Hopefully that's the case for South Carolina in 2024, because again, with the departures at quarterback and wide receiver, that's going to be essential to Shane Beamer and probably his shelf life as the head probably. coach yes. there in Columbia. Hey, Brent, let's get into some news and notes from around the Southeastern Conference, because I was in Tuscaloosa on Wednesday. I got to check out the media viewing period at a Kalen DeBoer coached Alabama football practice. Walked out of the indoor facility. First thing that hits me is music, <laughs> music at Alabama football practice, yeah. Brent. Yeah, right at the base of Paul Bear Bryant's legendary tower. Yes. there's about six speakers booming music <laughs> out. So that took a little bit of an adjustment. I bet it did. And then all the new coaches, obviously, Kalen DeBoer, <clears throat> Nick Sheridan, uh, Kane Womack, defensively, all these new assistants. Uh, a little bit of a different way of going about practice in general. But the one thing that struck me about that team, at least at this point, going into spring practice, we'll see what happens when the April portal rolls around. Still a lot of talent oh, on this Alabama oh yeah. roster. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No question about that. I was I was intrigued, as, as you talked about, Keon Keeley uh, making a position change from – Outside linebacker, defensive end, man, I've heard all kinds of tremendous things about him. Uh, this quarterback room, uh, I think, is going to be good. Uh, and, and by the way, Trav, is Austin Mack all of 6'6", like we've heard? He was on the far practice field as far away as he could get from us, and it still looked like he was 20 feet away from us. Yeah. That's how yeah. He looked like a cell tower in the distance throwing <laughs> passes. Uh, yeah. No, he's, a, he's a big dude, but I'll say this too. He's, he's fluid. He's not mechanical. Yeah. Right. You know, he's not sort of gawky looking, um, just very, very smooth, and the ball comes out nicely. Those four quarterbacks Alabama has right now, uh, that's, a, that's a really, really good group. Uh, and, and listen, this is a position you talked about the other day, and it bears repeating. Uh, Alabama fans also want to know, uh, is the center snap position improving from what they saw last year? Well, they brought in Parker Brailsford from Washington, so they're definitely counting on that. They also have a veteran and James Brockermeyer. Hasn't played much, but yes. it doesn't seem to be an issue for him. So I think – with Seth McLaughlin moving on to Ohio State, who, by the way, I hope it all gets figured out for him because really. he's a really good yes. player. But it's hard to to play that position in today's game if shotgun snaps are an uh, issue yeah. for you. So, yeah. yeah, I think they'll I think they'll be okay with the shotgun. Yeah, I, I agree. And Travis, it in in some ways, it's almost like if you're playing golf uh, and and you just got a a a kink in your swing or something that is. Uh, been a problem in trying to smooth that out. I'm with you. Hopefully, that that that, that we're gonna that is going to happen too. But a lot of a lot of eyes on uh, uh, Kane Womack on that and that defense. Uh, uh, Swarm defense. A lot of talent there too. There really is. Now there's a lot of youth and a lot of inexperience on the back end. But watching the corners, watching the safeties. Keon Sab comes in from Michigan to join Malachi Moore. At the safety position, Damani Jackson comes in from Southern Cal at corner. They've got some building blocks, no doubt about it. But they play, and Alabama was pretty much doing this before, they play a base with five defensive backs on the field. So you need two or three more guys at least, and then you need depth as well. Their front seven is going to be stout. Um, and then offensively, you know, they have some inexperience or some uh, you know, lacking production maybe at wide receiver, but the freshman Caleb Odom that came in as a tight end, they've got him at wide receiver. Yeah. Big dude, impressive yeah. dude. They've got three very capable backs, in my opinion. They got to get offensive tackle figured out. If you want to talk offense for Alabama right now, you know, Caden Proctor moves on to Iowa. Uh, J.C. Latham moves on to the NFL. Looks like Wilkin Formby, Elijah Pritchett. Uh, Nequil Bertrand to transfer from Texas A&M, Miles McBay. Those guys are in that mix. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, going to be fascinating spring in Tuscaloosa. No doubt. What about the Auburn Tigers, Brent? What's going on with that? 
uh, the, the coaching has um, been adjusted. Uh, we've got one Hugh Freeze calling the plays again. We understand. We understand. Ken Austin working with the quarterbacks. That that's the thing I still hear from Auburn beat writers. It's where their this quarterback situation is going to go. Peyton Thorne uh, again is a leader, uh, and all the the beat writers say he probably is going to be the leader. Uh, people may have forgotten DJ Durkin. Uh, and Charles Kelly, two very familiar names around the SEC on that defensive staff. Uh, but, again, Jarquez Hunter comes back. Uh, the Cams, as they like to say, uh, at receiver uh, have a lot of promise. But in Freeze's second year, uh, needless to say, Trav, because of some really poor recruiting over the last almost decade, Auburn still has a lot to do to replenish that roster. Yeah, I guess, you know, also sort of off the field, there were some interesting rumblings this week as we talk about Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss, some potential yes. dominoes that could have been in play related to Saban's retirement. Had Mike Norvell ended up in Tuscaloosa, might have Lane Kiffin ended up at Ole Miss. Uh, it's all – moot now, but certainly interesting to think about. Well, it's always fun to play the what if game uh, with this and, and to number one, to see that there really was uh, serious discussion, obviously uh, with Mike Norvell. I mean, things worked out well for him. He goes up to about 10 mil a year uh, with an extended contract. So they're in solid shape too, but I, I Trev, I, I thought for the last few days on and off, what what would FSU have been uh, with Lane throwing it all over the field? And again, with a very competent running game, probably better defensive players uh, at Florida State and, and what, what they may have done in that league this year. Is Florida State, though, a lateral move for uh, Lane? I, well, uh, I mean, you're so, already in the league that everybody wants to be in. You're yeah, in the yeah. Southeastern Conference. Now, the expectation is Florida State, by hook or by crook, is going to escape yes. the ACC and end up in the Big Ten or the SEC. So right. that's on the horizon, one would think. Um, but Lane also has a hell of a team coming back. He I does. mean, an argument could be made right now that I'd go with Ole Miss over Florida State on a neutral field if they played this afternoon just down the street in Old Legion Field. Yeah. Um, it would have been very interesting. Um, I think the commitment to football for both Florida State and Ole Miss is about the same. I think the brand of Florida State resonates a little yeah. bit more, right. and that's why I think people think it would just have been a slam dunk from Lane for Lane to go from Ole Miss to Florida State. But, but Florida State isn't flushing big money either. No. You know, no. I, I think that's the thing that gets overlooked or – uh, kind of misevaluated with Florida State. The brand is is illuminates still, um, but in terms of in terms of liquid and real money, yes, uh, Florida State isn't close to like oh, UF no. or no. some other places for sure. Hey, two other programs I wanted to ask you about before we get out of here. Give me something on Tennessee and LSU because they seem to be LSU especially because the recruiting's going so well for Brian Kelly when you look ahead to 2025. It just always feels like there's momentum on the side of LSU. Feel feels yeah, like we have the same well. discussion about LSU every year at this time. And then Tennessee, I wouldn't say a disappointing season in 2023, uh, but when you think about what the expectations are going to be for 2024, not that there's pressure on Josh Heupel, at this point, but with Nick Saban moving on, there feels like there's the potential Nico stepping in there at the quarterback position. Feels like the window is there, especially for Tennessee more so than it has been in maybe some previous years. Uh, there's some incredible excitement about Nico. As a matter of fact, I heard a Tennessee beat writer the other day say, when asked how good could Nico be, and he mentioned eventually he could be in the same category as a Peyton Manning. Now I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ready to jump in that boat yet. But the, the, they really do think that he is going to make a big difference. Look, 
Milton last year at Tennessee was okay. Uh, he could throw it 70 yards, but he could also miss a, an eight yard out too. Miss a billboard. Yeah. yeah no, yes. No question about that. Uh, Trev, the thing with me with Tennessee, I think they'll be okay offensively. Uh, the, the reality of it is uh, they've got to improve this defense. Then that, that's going to determine how far that they're going to go. Oregon State star Jermon McCoy is one of the guys that, that they brought in uh, on that uh, side of the ball, and Andre Turrentine from Ohio State. So watch the Tennessee defense. Um, and look, and you hit it on LSU. Uh, LSU is going to be fine, uh, particularly offensively. Uh, Garrett Nesmeyer, it's finally his turn, and I think he will be good. But look, uh, similar to Tennessee, what you and I have talked about for a long time for them, they're as good uh, as their defense is going to be. And when you bring in uh, the likes of uh, Blake Baker from Missouri as your uh, defensive coordinator, Bo Davis from Texas, Corey Raymond from Florida, I think that, to- that tells you uh, what they're going to be concentrating on during the spring is to make a defense. Last year that was abysmal, frankly, uh, to be a lot more respectable this year. Yeah, when I think LSU and Tennessee side by side, I default to roster quality Yep, 95% of the time where LSU is concerned having the advantage there. And I say that, and then I remember Tennessee going down to Baton Rouge a couple of years ago and just woodshedding yeah. the Tigers at, uh, in Death Valley. So you got to be a little bit careful with that because Josh Heupel to me is like a good three-point shooter mm-hmm. in basketball the way he can run an offense, the way he can put together an offense, it gives them a chance against teams that probably are five, six, seven, eight players better in terms of roster than the ball. So, you know, that's the thing with UT that I continue to look at recruiting roster quality, obviously committed a lot, literally and figuratively to Nico. Uh, but how that is spread out, how they're able to upgrade around that position is going to be the difference between them being a team that can win 10 games like they did a couple of years ago and a team that wins maybe one or two fewer on an annual basis. Well, Brent, it's always a lot of fun with you here on Second Helping. We certainly hope you'll like the channel, like the program, turn on those notifications. You'll get every one of these episodes as they drop. Anything else, Brent, before we get out of here? Yeah, uh, I'm sure you appreciated the irony like I did. Uh, Travis, a former Mississippi State coach, Zach Harnett, <laughs> going to Ole Miss to be a defensive analyst. Smart move uh, by um, by Lane to do that, but it's amazing. That's peak, peak Lane Kiffin, yeah. <laughs> that, you know, you go from the Egg Bowl uh, just a few months ago to now being on the Ole Miss staff. We've seen Nick Saban do it too, though. That's right. You know, Absolutely. Come yeah. to, come here and also, by the way, bring your playbook and everything you know about the place and the personnel uh, you previously worked with. Uh, and, and Trent, my, my last question would be, uh, I'm guessing Pops did pretty well on those five questions recently, right? Well, you know, it's bittersweet because <laughs> uh, we did have here on the channel – uh, an updated uh, visit with Pops, and it crushed the rest of our content from the views. <laughs> so, Brent, we are very much secondary to Pops. I understand. Here on the channel. But we're, we're getting there, Brent. Good, we're getting good. there with uh, Man, Second Helping. No, it, it was very well received. I think people just like catching up with him. I'm you know, sure they do. heard from him in a while. I took him to uh, Gainesville Tuesday night for that Alabama-Florida yeah. Yes. basketball game. So he enjoyed that. He got some ribs at Adams Rib Company. Oh, oh. That was probably the highlight for him, but he got to see <laughs> yeah. his Gators get a big win. Right, uh, right. Got him home late Tuesday night, got in the car, drove to football practice at Alabama on Wednesday. So been a fun week, been a busy week. I but, bet it uh, has. Always a lot of good stuff with you, Brent. Always look forward to doing it. Me too, brother. Take care. For Brent Beard, Travis Ryer, thanking you once again for joining us here on Second Helping. And until next time, So long, everybody.